You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome back. Uh, we are talking today about villains. Villains and developing the conflict within your story. It is much more fun to write about villains than heroes. The villains are the ones that think out the scheme, and the heroes just kind of come along for the ride. DJ McHale. Our topic today is going to be about developing the conflict within your story and then placing and creating a villain that fits the conflict, that fits, most importantly, your main character. Because if your villain doesn't match your main character, you don't have a good villain. Or maybe you don't have a good hero. There are many types of literary conflict. There's the writer versus the novel, the writer versus the writer, Writer versus Twitter, writer versus successful writer, writer versus long boozy lunch, writer versus the re desire to rearrange the bookshelves, and the writer versus the dog who wants a walk. <laughs> Obviously, these aren't the actual conflicts in a story. These are the conflicts an author faces every day. So... Let's look at the actual kinds of conflict that you can have within a story. First off, you have the man versus self. This is a lot of traditional stories. The man has that internal conflict. The, the character, the hero of your story is battling an internal conflict of some kind. A good representation of this, I think, is Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven story, I want to say. Um, or is it, the, what's the one called with the heartbeat? Telltale Heart. Telltale Heart. That's a pretty good internal conflict because he's fighting with himself over his past actions. And then you have man versus man. This is most of your conflicts in stories. It is a character fighting another character. Those two people or those two groups kind of going head to head. Man versus God. And we're also going to include AI in here. It's the rebellion against the larger force, the greater being that is above themselves. Um, then you have man versus nature. One example of this, I think, would be um, Lord of the Flies. That's man versus human nature. But then you also have man versus nature itself, trying to survive the elements. Um, the, the middle grade book, Hatchet, is a good example of man versus nature. Then you have man versus society. A lot of your dystopian books fall in that category. They are fighting against the society itself and trying to take the society structure down. Um, you have man versus destiny. That's any time your character is fighting against what they are destined to do and trying to avoid um, maybe it's a prophecy that they're trying to avoid or something like that. A lot of uh, Greek myths are man versus their destiny. Uh, you have man versus technology. We separated this from AI because AI becomes a being on its own. Technology is not sentient, but they are still fighting whatever that technology is. Um, then you have man versus time. They're running out of time. They're trying to get as much out of time as they can. A good example of that would be a story where maybe somebody has a deadline to their life. They know they're going to die at a certain time, and they're trying to avoid it or push it back or something. They're fighting time itself. And we already had man versus destiny. I don't know how that showed up twice. <clears throat> Um, these are various kinds of plot lines. This came from a list in the Writer's Digest books in 1993. Um, different kinds of plots that you can have within the conflict. So you have your quest plot, that's kind of your hero's adventure, sorry, hero's journey story. They're going out and they have to fulfill a quest. They have a goal that they're trying to reach, a thing they're trying to get. You have your adventure plot lines. 
Uh, Lord of the Rings is kind of an adventure because they're going out into the world. They're adventuring as they go about. Uh, there's a couple other good examples. Um, pirate stories tend to be adventures. Um, anyway, all these different ones. Pursuit, rescue, escape, revenge, the riddle, rivalry, underdog, temptation, metamorphosis, transformation, uh, maturation, love, forbidden love, sacrifice, discovery, wretched excess, ascension, and descension. These are all different kinds of plots that feed the conflict, that add to it. There are many different kinds of plots, different kinds of conflict that don't include simply a good versus evil. So Good versus evil tends to be your knight in shining armor is going out to defeat the monster. You have your good fighting against your evil. Good prevails. Not every story has to be that. Sometimes you can have two things that are both good, but cannot exist together. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is actually the freedom versus security. This was represented really well in the um, Marvel movie. Why is it slipping my mind? Captain America Civil War. <laughs> um, you have team Captain, or keep team Captain America, team Iron Man, and they're on different sides of this freedom versus security. Iron Man, it's a good cause to want to put the restrictions on the superheroes so that they're limited in the damage that they can do and trying to make the world a safer place. Captain America is on the side of freedom. Yes, that is a worthy goal, but we don't need those restrictions. By restricting us, you're harming us. You're harming the people because then we won't be able to act and save them if there's a potential threat. So that's one example of a not good versus evil because both of those things are good things but they cannot coexist simultaneously. Then you have your personal success versus your altruism stories, where which one do you put ahead of the other? Do you put your personal success first over the idea that you're going to help others and assist them in the process of their lives? So. In Frozen, Elsa was actually putting altruism over herself, or at least attempting to, because she ran away so she wouldn't hurt anybody, um, even if it meant isolating herself and kind of taking herself out of the world. So that's kind of that idea of, do you put yourself or others first? And that can be a good conflict for your story. Um, you also have the past versus the future. Um, I, this is also kind of represented with the idea of preservation versus progress. Do we want to push forward in the world? Do your characters want to make technological advances? Do they want to go into the next age? Or are they trying to preserve the current status quo? What sides are there? One of the examples that I recently saw of this is a Korean drama called Startup. And one of the characters in the show is, uh, did a startup business for an AI company and they were building a security AI system that was going to put a lot of people out of business. And it was kind of a whole plot line of an episode of how important it was between the people of, you know, we, we care about this character who is a security worker, who is a security guard, and he's going to get fired because this company, but this company is building this AI so that it's easier to stop crime. So it, it was a debate of, do we hold on to the past and save the livelihoods of all of these people, or we try to move into the future to make the world better for the next generation. Your next kind of conflict that you can have is uh, individual versus community. 
And the example that we have for this one is in Star Trek, it's the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. It's very much that we're putting the community ahead of what we personally desire or what we personally want. It's a really, really good basis for conflict between characters as well as between entire cultures. And then the final one that we're going to talk about is privacy versus transparency. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the freedom and security. But with privacy and transparency, it's the idea of that information availability. Is it more important to have information private to save, you know, to protect the, the privacy of people? Or is it more important that information is out there so that potential problems can be stopped before they even begin? A lot of, com a lot of sort of AI uh, technology will, will fall into this category. Um, one example is from personal, sorry, not personal, person of interest. That is a consistent debate through the entire series is, is it more important that these people have their privacy or that we stop the crimes from happening? So let's get into the fun part. Those are all the different kinds of conflict that you can have. And conflict is the basis of your story. If you don't have a good conflict, if you don't have a good battle that's going to, to occur, it's not going to be an interesting story. You need some kind of either internal or external force that is working against your main character. And of course, one of the best kinds of forces that you can have working against your main character is a villain. I wore my Disney villains shirt today for a reason. <laughs> I love villains, they're great. So what makes a good villain? Let's get into the key ingredients of a good villain. First off, you need a realistic motivation. They need to have a reason for what they do, a reason for the villainy, and it cannot be power for the sake of power. It's just not good enough. It's boring. Why do they want that power? Do they want that power because they felt inferior for a good portion of their life and they want to prove everyone wrong? Do they want that power in order to save someone's life? Do they want that power because they need control? They have that need to control the things around them. Why do they want their power? A realistic motivation can also be a really good way to make them sympathetic. If you're looking to have your readers kind of look at your villain and go, I understand what you're doing. I understand why you're doing it. They need the power so that they can save their loved one. I get that. I, you know, I can back that up. What I can't get behind is the means. So when you're looking for a realistic motivation, dig into their backstory. Build a realistic one. Something made them the way they are. There was something in their history, in their story, that turned them to the, onto the path that they're taking, that made them want to take the shortcuts that villains often take. One good thing to keep in mind, whether you're building your villain or your hero first, is that this is their backstory is often parallel to the, your hero's story. They both kind of started in the same place and ran into the, in the same direction. However, your villain makes the bad choices. They take the shortcuts. They take the easy way to get to the end result. And that is one way, oh, sorry. Um, speaking of the hero, one way that you make a good villain is they have to have some kind of tie to the hero. They can't just be this entity out there that is doing things that the hero needs to stop. They need to have some reason for your villain and your hero to interact and for your hero to want to take down the villain. Sometimes that happens through the mentor. Take, uh, consider Star Wars. The, 
hero, Luke, in Star Wars, has both of these. First off, his tie to the, he, the villain, Darth Vader, is Darth Vader is his father. But he also has a tie through the mentor. Obi-Wan was Darth Vader's mentor. Mas what's the word? Master. Master. <laughs> All I could think was Padawan. And I'm like, that's not right. Darth Vader was Obi-Wan's Padawan. So they need to have some kind of tie together. Some personal connection there that makes the fight more important. And that's kind of the, the purpose here is, yes, it's good to want to take down this big regime and take down the big bad villain that's kind of out there in the distance. But if they're out there in the distance, why do your readers care? Why should they care about this entire conflict? Because your villain is your basis for your conflict. Let's now look at the traits of a villain. So you've kind of looked at the key ingredients, the realistic motivation, a realistic backstory, and they're tied to the hero. Now, the individual traits of a villain. First of all, they absolutely believe that they're the good guy. They believe they are doing the right thing. They are on the side of good. Or at least, they have a moral code that they stick to. It could be their own moral code. It doesn't have to line up with anybody else's, but there's usually some kind of code that they live by. And that helps them feel like they're the good guy because they say, I have these rules, I'm following them. There are obvious exceptions. The Joker is a good exception for that. He doesn't really have a moral code, but he's chaotic. The other thing that helps them believe that they're the good guy is that they have a team of supporters. They have people on their side. They have minions. Maybe they're paying them and the people are just showing up for a you know paycheck, but they have some people who are supporting them who tell them, yes, you are doing the right thing. The other trait of a hero is that they're a dark mirror. Sorry, the other trait of the villain is that they're a dark he mirror to the hero. This kind of goes along with that parallel backstory thing. S but it's that similar situations, different choices. An example of that is Harry Potter and Voldemort. Harry Potter and Voldemort, both, both orphans, both grew up in terrible situations, both discovered later on that they were magical and that they were part of this magical society. Both went to the same school, both had the same mentors. They made wildly different decisions. So Harry Potter turned out to be the good guy, the, the, the guy who defeated the bad and made the good decisions through most of his life. He always stuck up for his friends. He always defended them. He always tried to be good. While Voldemort, you know, tricked some kids in a cave and gave them nightmares for the rest of their lives. Um, another trait of a villain is that they're often disturbed in some way. This kind of plays into why they think they're the good guy is because they don't have the same perspective on good as the rest of the world. Examples of this, you have psychopathy and sociopathy. Um, I've always kind of mixed those two together, so I'm not going to give you a definition there but they're good things to research if you're trying to come up with a good villain for you. You also have Machiavellianism. This is, uh, if you consider Othello, the Shakespeare play um, Iago, he was kind of a Machiavelli Machia Machiavellian villain. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> Which is that kind of puppet master. He likes to control people and make them do what he wants. That... Um, manipulation sort of basis. And then you have narcissism. They are wonderful and can do no, no wrong. And everything is about them. That's a very self-centered view of the world. Other traits, your villain absolutely can be likable. I love a likable villain. 
they are still human, after all. Of course, not all of them are actually human, but you get what I mean. <laughs> Your villains can have a good sense of humor. A villain who knows when to laugh and how to make people laugh is so much fun. It's that charismatic sort of villain that really does draw people to his side. And if you want them to be likable, if you are aiming for that, then they are going to be kind to some people. Usually they're going to be kind to the innocent and the naive. Those people who we want to see other characters being sympathetic towards. If we see that, then we have a little bit of a sympathy or alliance with the villain. So if you're going for that, that's one way to do it. And another way that they can be likable, again, they can have a sympathetic cause. They can be doing something for a good reason. We can't really fault Thanos for wanting to save the, the universe by making sure there's enough resources for everyone. That was his ultimate goal. His means of doing it was wrong because he wanted to just get rid of half of the people and suddenly there'd be enough resources. There's a lot of logic problems with that. But the actual reason, the cause that he was fighting for, is sympathetic. Now, if you are going to have a group of villains, you do want them to be unsympathetic of some way. It's going to be a horde, and you shouldn't have a horde of villains that have any of this or any of the, the previous sympathetic traits. Good examples, robots, zombies, and cannibalistic cultists. These kind of mass hordes of bad guys that the characters have to fight, you don't really want to humanize them because it takes too much time. They're a group instead of an individual. Now, you can have exceptions. I am legend. You have one robot that is the exception um, in... Doctor Who, you have handles. He is one Cyberman head that you can be sympathetic towards. But it's always one of the rest of the Horde. The rest of the Horde, unsympathetic, inhuman. And it's fine. So let's get into the actual design of the villain. How do you start to create your villain? You have the key ingredients. You have kind of the idea of the sort of traits that you can include. So how do you build them? One of the easiest ways to do this is to base it on a real life villain. You want to create a tyrannical yet charismatic ruler? Just look and research into Hitler. He used the socio-political environment of Germany post-World War I in order to rally followers and build a group of people who were sympathetic to his cause because he wanted to just say, we need to defeat these countries who were trying to control us after our previous government failed to protect us. So he was very charismatic and through that whole process convinced a lot of people to do really horrible things. If you need a, hear a serial killer who plans ahead for when the whim strikes him to kill, research Israel Keys. He buried murder kits around the US just in case he was in the area and felt like killing somebody that day. Um, so find a real life villain and look into what made them tick, what made them a villain in life. And then give them a history of villainy. They didn't start your story by doing bad things. They don't start, sorry, rephrase that. They don't start doing bad things at the beginning of your story. Most of the time they had something that led up to it, that led up to the main conflict of, in, of your story. They've been bad for a while. They've been a tyrannical ruler for a while. And finally people at their breaking point and want to take them down. They've been killing before the story starts or they've been stalking people or doing other petty crimes before your story starts, and then the first murder happens, and that's when it begins. So what are they doing that is villainous before your story begins? Develop that out and plan it, and then make it part of your story. 
The next thing to consider when building your villain is they need to be a worthy challenger. You have to make them as strong or stronger, preferably, than your hero. If your villain is weaker than your hero, then what is the point of the story? Uh, one really good example of a terrible villain is Iron Man 3, in the, man, uh, the Mandarin in Iron Man 3. That villain plot was such a flop because in the Marvel comics, the Mandarin's actually a really good villain and very powerful, very strong. Through Iron Man 3, he goes through all of this and his whole thing to defeat is an actor? Eh, it's not a good plot. So you need to have your villain be stronger. Make it so that the hero has to work towards being able to actually defeat your villain. The next thing, enjoy it. Embrace the villainy and the bad things. Put yourself in the shoes of the villain and have a little fun with it. Let your mind wander into the dark realms of the world. That will help you create a realistic villain, something that people will look at and say, oh, that's frightening, but it's frightening because it's possible. And don't worry, you're still a good person. Even if you can put yourself in the mind of a serial killer or a tyrant or whatever, you, as the author, are still a good person. Don't worry about writing bad people. Readers don't think you are them. And then as you go to write your character, write them just the same as you would any other character in your story. You don't want to make them sound too different. Please don't give your villain overly flowery language that sounds stuffy and excessive. Because then it doesn't match the rest of your character's tones because then they sound fake. A couple of exceptions to this would be if you have a character, if your villain is a thousand years old and they've lived in isolation for the last 500 years, they, sure, they might still talk like they were from the 1500s. But most of the time, you want them to be talking the same kind of way that the rest of your characters talk. On the flip side of the sounding too stuffy, you don't want to make them sound too ignorant and too dumb because then them as the villain isn't realistic. So their dialogues, their reactions, how they respond should be as intricate as your main characters. Don't have your villains take the easy answer all the time, if your characters aren't taking the easy answer all the time. And then, of course, plot out their scheme. What do they want? What are they willing to do to get it? And why is the hero in their way? Those are the three things you need to know about your villain's goal in order to write a good one and to make sure that they are an important part of the conflict as a whole in the story. Because what they want and why the hero is in their way, those are the conflict. Those, are, those things are the basis for your conflict. If you're looking for additional resources, um, here is a good list to refer to. Um, we've talked quite a bit about villainy and villains. It is a fun topic for both Lee and I to discuss. We will be back uh, in, we will be back in about uh, one hour to talk about plotting your stories, building those plot structures. Uh, even if you're a pantser, this is a really good idea to have in your mind. I don't necessarily plot everything. I am a pantser, but I need to know some of the structure I'm working towards as I'm writing. So join us again in about an hour. And thank you and write selfishly.
If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 